plan of God Almighty. Jeremiah was a mighty prophet of God. And Jeremiah, I'm not going to go into the full teaching of Jeremiah, but Jeremiah was a mighty man of God. He was called before he was even formed in the womb of his mother. And God touched Jeremiah as a little boy, put the word in his mouth and said, I have anointed you to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah was a man who was serving as a, in the office of the prophet to the kingdom, to the nation of Israel and Judah at a time when there was great prosperity. There was the word, the law was being given, the law of Moses, pretty much like our day today in America, in our society. Israel was prosperous. They were blessed. They had many priests and prophets going around saying everything is good. You can have your best day now, your best day on earth. Everything is fine and dandy. I mean, the, the, the kingdom was of the wheels was moving. But God had touched Jeremiah and said that the hearts of the people of, of God's chosen nation had turned so far away from God that they were living in an age of an apostasy. And they had fallen away from biblical truths. And most importantly, they had lost sight of their first love, which was God Almighty. Very similar to what happened today in this world in America. There are a lot of churches around the world that claim to preach the gospel. But it's more or less a society, a social club, a, a social gathering. And that's very dangerous. Because yes, it's, it, it, it's, we're called to come and gather and fellowship and but we're also called to, to help each other to be aligned in God's word and God's plan. And that, that's not to play with God. God don't play with us. Amen. He loves us. He gives us the full blessing. He loves us. He loves you guys with a passion. But we, we must not play with God because God doesn't play around. God is very serious with you. You're his choice possession. You're his choice creation. He created you. And He's when he's created you and he looked at you, he said, now this is my master. You look to the person next to you and say, you're God's masterpiece. Amen? Don't, don't worry about the, the, the coffee breath or anything like that. But you are God's masterpiece. Amen? God created each and every one of us. You look to that person next to you and say, you are beautiful. You are made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. God loves you. God died just for you. And God rose from the dead just for you. Jesus is, is the Lord and the Savior of the world. And for those who would accept Him, shall have eternal life. Amen. That's the gospel. But for those who refuse that word, just like in Israel and Judah, those who refuse the word of the Lord, God told Jeremiah, judgment is coming. God told Jeremiah to tell the people of Israel and Judah that, that there was a, a, a nation that had a different language, had a different culture, different, a different way of looking at things, a different God. And God said, they're going to come. They're going to snatch you away. They're going to take you to a land that you do not know of. And, and basically it was going backwards because Abraham was from the land of the, of the Chaldeans. Was from that area of where the, the Babylonians were from. It was like going backwards. God was taking the people of Abraham backwards to, to, to begin all over again. And that, that's what was happening. God said, because you're living in ignorance. He told Jeremiah to tell the people, you're living in ignorance. I'm going to take you back to the very beginning so that you can understand where you came from and where you need to really be going. They had forgotten. They had fallen into such deep sin in their life. They had fallen into such deep sin in their life. And I'm going to ask you, and you by way of the internet, are, are we counted among people like that today on the earth? Where we thought we've known God, where we had once proclaimed the goodness and the faithfulness of Almighty God, only to all of a sudden go backwards. And God having to start all over with us again. Are we compromising in sin? Are we allowing, you know, when, 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 when it's going good in our life, you know, we're living in sin. But when it's hard in our life, oh, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. Is that us today? Is that us? And God don't play. God don't play. God says, repent, turn from iniquity, turn from sin. And you shall have life and I will give you life. And God is the giver of life. Amen. He is the giver of life. Amen. In Jeremiah chapter 7. It's very similar to what we read, how God spoke to Jeremiah to speak to the nation of Israel and Judah. And I believe Jeremiah 7 is a very profound chapter in the entire Bible. Because that, that speaks volumes to how our society operates today. I'm going to go through this chapter, chapter 7, Jeremiah. And we're going to compare it to how it speaks to us today. Are you, are you the people of God? Are you the people of God? Amen. 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 God was speaking to a people of ancient times. And look how quickly they had fallen away 
Jeremiah chapter 7. It says the word, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Jeremiah was being told to go to the place of worship. Just like today, when God speaks, God speaks to, through the office of the evangelist, the prophet, the pastor, the apostle, the teacher, in the house of God. In the house of God. He told Jeremiah, go to the house of the Lord where you worship. Go and speak this word that I'm going to give to the people. Go and speak it in the church. And that's where the word is being given today. That God does not change. He does not change. And he's speaking through his ministers, through the watchmen, so to speak. As Ezekiel once recorded, he's speaking to the church today in our time. As he spoke in this time we're reading about thousands of years ago. And verse 3 he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Three times God says that. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I give to your fathers forever. God had found something wrong with his people. And God said, I'm going to speak to my people through the house of worship. And Jesus said, he threw the, the, the money changers out of the temple of God in Jerusalem. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And God was saying that this is his house. He's very specific about the temple. And you, body of Christ, you are the temple of God today. And your temple, your physical body, your spiritual body should be a house of prayer. Jesus kicks out anything that doesn't belong he, with, with a godly anger. And he says that this will be a house of prayer. You shall be a house of prayer. But he's speaking to those times of the, the people who are worshiping in the temple. And I believe he's speaking to us today. We can quickly, easily be deceived by deceptive words by false prophets today. Second Timothy said that there would be a, a, an apostasy, that there would be demonic teachings, that there would be people in the pulpit who are really being taught by demonic spirits. And first and second Timothy teaches that. Do your homework. And the Lord said that it was no different in the times of, of, of Jeremiah. They were being led away by deceptive words. That they, they were having their ears, so to speak, tickled by a message that really was no message of God at all. Hmm. And when you hear a message that's really not from God, where does that lead you? When you're reading books and going books upon books, not in the word of God, where would that lead you? If you're seeking horoscopes and, spend, and, and palm readers and all kinds of, you know, you know, silly things and not seeking the presence of God Almighty, where does that lead you? It leads you away from God. It leads you into a life of sin and deception and being deceived. And God said, amend your ways. Amend your ways. Do not trust these deceptive words. He says, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood, and you do not walk after other gods to your own room, then I will let you live in this place. I mean, I will let you live. We have a problem with aliens today in our nation. Amen? Now, I'm not getting political here, but we do have a problem. There was one time when this nation opened their arms to immigrants from all over the world. Amen. And the Bible says in the last day, the love of many will grow cold. As a nation, we've closed our arms. We said no more. No more. Now there's got to be all kinds of rules, and there's got to be 10-year waiting periods. There's got to be this, and there's got to be that. And it all comes down to money, money, money. If you got money, you can buy citizenship. And the Bible says, the Bible says, do not oppress the alien. People who are truly people who are looking for a better life. Do not oppress them. The word of God is in America. You can't find the word of God too much in other parts of this world. It will be there, but not as great as it is in America. In America, people come from all parts of the world. They will find the word of God because there's a church around every corner. The Bible is so easily accessible in this nation. Come, come, says the Lord. But we oppress them. The orphan and the widow. The church's job is to take care of the orphan and the widow, but yet we allow the United States government to take care of that with Medicare and food stamps when it was the church's job in the first place to take care of it. And Israel was no different. They were oppressing the alien. 
They were not taking care of the poor and the widow. They were starving people. They were living in third world conditions in some parts of the nation, while other parts were living in prosperity. And I, and I speak to you by way of the internet. Anybody who has prospered, God has blessed you. you, you, you I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus says, sell everything. Sell everything. Because a, a lot of people who have great amounts of money, that is their God. And people who have no amounts of money chase after that God too. Live this life as though you passed your treasures on the heaven. Hold on to nothing. Build no storehouses for yourself. But it goes on to say here, and they shed innocent blood. They shed innocent blood. What does that mean? America, as well as, and I'm getting ready to go into something here, and a little bit in the teaching. Israel had a problem with shedding innocent blood. There was a lot of pagan worship going on in Israel and in Judah. And the, the Jewish people, they adopted that pagan worship. And it had to do with killing their children. It had to do with killing their children to offer up to false idols. It's the same thing we have with abortion going on in America today. And I'm going to get into that in just a bit. But God said, don't shed innocent blood. And innocent blood is being shed in America. Since 1973, America has murdered, murdered over 50 million plus lives, babies. We have shed innocent blood. What about the other innocent blood? A man who's just working in a convenience store, trying to earn a living for his family, getting shot in the head, back and in the head. What about people who are getting carjacked and robbed? And we see on the United States of America, the streets of America, we see so much murder, innocent blood being shed. We see so much injustice, so much poverty, so much people so broken without Jesus Christ in their lives because they don't know they truly do not know. And it's the church's responsibility to tell them about the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. As well as that they already know the wrath and judgment of God. I was talking to someone here very recently. They know they're wrong with God. They know they're wrong with God. They know they've done a lot of bad things. But they didn't understand that there's a way out. That, that God has grace and mercy through His Son, only through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we as a church, we have to tell them the news. The Bible says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. Amen. But the Bible also says that if they don't accept the word, then dust, the, dust off of your feet and leave that place. Amen. God is serious about his word. He will give everyone an opportunity to respond to the light that, is, that shines from the kingdom of heaven. But as we read on here in verse 8, it says, Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail by false prophets. He says, Well, you steal, murder, commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you do not know, that you have never known. This is idolatry. What is idolatry? When you're doing something to please self. When you're focused on self and not on God, that is what you call idolatry. And in America, I don't even have to go into it. America is filled with idolatry. Where we're chasing after the almighty dollar. We're chasing after what pleases us. What suits our lifestyle. What, what suits what we know pleases us. That's idolatry. When you don't seek the kingdom of God. When you don't seek the plan of God. To glorify God. And to bring others into the kingdom of God. And you're, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're not, if you're doing it for self. You're caught up in idolatry. If you're sleeping in someone else's bed. And not your own. You're adulterer, fornicator, liar, cheater, perverter. You know, this is idolatry because you're wanting to please self. And naturally, every single human being has the flesh. Whether you're a Christian or not, we have a sin nature within us. And for the Christian, we have the advantage because we have the Holy Spirit within us that convicts us of when we're wrong. And God, that spirit voice leads us into the paths of righteousness. And we must understand that it is like working out your muscles. You must work out that spiritual muscle and begin to hear the voice of God. Train yourself to listen to the voice of God. You need to train yourself. But, but if, how can we do that when we're living in America and in society, where we're, we're living in a fast food society, and everything that is given to us is, is, you know, we want everything fast, fast, fast. Nobody wants to work the hard way. Nobody wants to, to earn an honest living anymore. Everyone wants things fast and done fast and done quickly and done now and here, right now. Like Burger King, you can have it your way. You know, that's the way society is in America. 
If there's an easier way, I'm going to do it. That's the way America thinks now. That's why nothing is made in America no more. Everything's made in China. Everything's made in other countries. Because America has lost focus of what we were founded on from the very beginning. Americans, whether you're a Christian or not, you're, you're lazy. And compromise. I know such a great number of Christians who claim the word, claim Jesus, and they live in such, such compromise. And they're going to be in for a rude awakening. They're going to find out that they really had no relationship with Jesus Christ at all. And I pray that it's none of you guys. I know you guys. You have a heart for the Lord. But then I'm speaking to you by the way of the internet. And if that, that is you, run, run from, from idolatry. Run from, from the temple of demons. Run from the voice of the enemy. Run and run to God. James says, flee from the devil and run to God and the devil will run away from you. Verse 10, it says, if you will say these things, if you, if you will do these things, and then come and stand before me in this house, meaning in the church, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered, that you may do all these abominations, has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, says the Lord, have seen, declares the Lord. God, God is saying that in those days of, of apostasy, God was saying in those days, you're going to do all these filthy things. You're going to go out partying and drinking and, and, and drink a beer and say, oh, Jesus is good. You're going to do these things and then come into my house and say, God is good and God is the Lord. And then you're going to live like that, says God. God told them in Israel, says, well, I'm watching you. Now, how do you think God is saying that to people today? God is saying, I'm watching you. God says, I'm recording what you're doing. There's a book of remembrance that God is writing. It's the book of life. And there's many books that will be opened up at the judgment seat of Christ and at the great white throne of God's judgment upon unbelievers. There are books that are being written with things that you've done, things that you've said, things that you've thought. And there are so many books that are being written about the book of remembrances of what God, God will recall everything. He's got video, you know, rewind and forward, and he'll go right to that spot when you thought nobody else was looking. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm telling you this because this is, this is true. This is the word of God. And God wants to set you free from, that, from that, that, that event that one day we will all have to meet God. God is wanting to set us free from that through the blood of Jesus Christ and one of the pardons of our sin. And he can and he will and he can do it, but it's got to be something that you freely receive with joy. But the judgment of God is coming. God is saying, you know my word. You know how I stand on things, says the Lord. You know where I'm coming from. Why, oh child, do you compromise? Why are you putting your faith and your life into the hands of Satan? Why are you jeopardizing, you know? Why are you doing these things? The idolatry is something from the very beginning that happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan told Adam and Eve, you can have it your way. And they, they believed the lie. And look where it led us today. Go with me to verse 16. This is something that's going to get a little hard and thick in here. God is saying, are you going to come into my house and say we're saved, we're delivered? And, and you're supposed to be my people? You're supposed to declare my kingdom on this earth. And then you're going to live in sin and compromise. And then you're going to come in my house and say, oh, we're delivered. Praise the Lord. You're going to do that? Are you serious? Says God. You really are going to do that. Verse 16. This is what God says to them. He says, as for you, do not pray for these people. And do not lift up a cry or a prayer for them. And do not intercede with me. For I do not hear you. He's telling Jeremiah, because Jeremiah is crying to God in this story. And Jeremiah is saying, oh, Lord, don't destroy these people, Lord. Lord, they're your people, Lord. Don't, don't destroy them. God is saying, do not cry no more. Do not offer me a prayer anymore, because I'm not going to hear you. See, God has the advantage over Jeremiah. See, God knows all the hearts. God knows all the mind. God knows all the thinking, all the motives. And Jeremiah only knew what he could see. Jeremiah couldn't penetrate the deep, deep thoughts of a man, but God can. And God, therefore, understood what was truly in the hearts of the people. Is it like that today? Is it like that today? Can God truly penetrate the deepest, the most innermost chambers of your heart and your mind? Yes, he can. Can he see what the real motive is? Yes, he can. And God is saying, 
And only God knows when, when a person comes to that point in their life when they're living in, in, in such a reprobate mind. A mind that absolutely will not turn to God. God knows. God knows if you will come to Him or not. And in the end, there's got to be a point in time where God is either going to welcome you into His kingdom or He's going to shut you out for eternity from His presence. And God knows if you're playing. A lot of people say, well, I ain't seen God move. It's just because God knows you're in serious. I can't hear God because God says you won't listen. Because God knows it's going to go in one ear and out the other. But when you're serious, when you're ready to, to understand and embrace the teaching, the word, and the fellowship, and the relationship of Jesus Christ, God will move and speak to you. Amen. And he will lead you into further knowledge and to further understanding. You will walk and do the things that Christ did on the face of this earth. Verse 17, uh, actually I want to take you. J Jeremiah is crying, crying, and God says, don't talk to me about these people anymore. I don't want to hear it. Just write these scriptures down because I'm going to move very quickly now. Just write these scriptures down to, to, to talk about this. People can say, God, God ain't like that. that. Maybe that was Old Testament, but this is the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It says, for this reason, God will send upon the world a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe in the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. In this context of scripture, this talks about a future time in the world where the Antichrist will arise. And because people refuse to be saved and refuse to give God glory and refuse to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God is saying the people who are going to be left behind in the rapture by the rapture, after the rapture of the church. The people are going to be left into the tribulation. God is saying that when the Satan Antichrist arises, God is going to allow all people living on the face of the earth to believe the lie that Satan will speak. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Read it in its context. You can't just read something and say, oh, this is God's... you got to read it in its context. And it's saying in its context is God is saying there will come a point in time where God will bring wrath and judgment on people on this earth who truly do not want to turn to Him. If you don't want to turn to God right now, and I'm speaking by you by the way of the internet, if you don't want to turn to Jesus right now, what makes you think you're going to turn to him when the Antichrist arises? When a man whose words are going to be such smooth and flattering, he's going to talk, I mean, this is going to be the full power of Satan on the earth in the form of man. He is going to be a silver tongued devil. I got, I got a glimpse of that a long time ago. When, when, when the president once said, I do not have sexual relations with that woman. And, you know, I was far from God. I was in disobedience. And I said, I told my wife, that man's telling the truth. Ain't nobody going to get on camera and lie like that. We kept to find out that president was doing that. <laughs> He's going to blow that man away. This man is going to have a silver tongue. He's going to speak and the world is going to be believed a lie. Because the Bible says that God says in 2 Thessalonians that God will allow these people to believe a lie. Because they refuse to be saved. <coughs> and if you're refusing the working of Christ in your life right now, what will happen to you, old child? What will happen to you? You believe that the Lord was to come today. In verse 17, he says, Do you see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out a drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Do they spite me, declares the Lord? It is not themselves they despise to their own shame. God is saying here that the whole family is involved in sin. There was a point in time where society in America had a TV show called Father Knows Best. Who can remember that? Raise your hand. That ain't true today, is it? There's a movie out that came out called Courageous. I urge you to go see it. One of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. It's a long movie, but it's a great movie. And it talks about the absence of a father. But Jeremiah is talking in this time to the people of Israel and Judah. He's saying that the children go and gather the wood. The, fire, the, 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 the father, they kindle the fire. And the women, the mothers, they, they bake the bread for the queen of heaven. What it's saying is that the whole household at that time in history was caught up in sin. The whole household which God instituted for a husband, wife, and children. There was supposed to be a, a, an order of things. And today, as well as in those times, the whole order was out of whack. Just as it was in the Garden of Eden. Who did Satan come to? He didn't come to Adam. He came to Eve. He disrupted the order of God's order. And that's what Satan has always done. Today, he comes to the kids. 
And the kids get on the parents' nerves and the parents just don't want to put up with it no more. And the parents don't want to have the patience to raise their children up in a godly environment. And they just say, I'll just let them do what they want. Let them just let them have their way. And fathers don't want to stand on the word of God and trust the word of God anymore. And that's why we have a society that, that is gone the way it's gone. That's why we have killings in high schools and murders and suicides and abortions and rapes and everything in society in America. Because the fathers, the men of God, will not stand up for righteousness and holiness. And this is exactly what was happening in these times. The people of God were looking like the world. The children were involved in sin. They were getting the wood. The fathers were getting the wood from the children. They were making the fire. And the women, they would come out and they would bake the bread. And they would offer that food up to false idols. This was God's people. The whole household was caught up in sin. Today, during the day, a young man will go to a, a website on the internet that's X-rated. And then later on that night, the father will go to the same computer and be on it late at night when he thinks nobody's watching. Hmm. The son and the father are caught up in the same sin. The mother and the daughter are against each other. Parents don't know how to act. Children don't know how to act no more because sin has engulfed the entire home. And that's why we see such great divorce rates. That's why we see such many children raised up in, in you know, this is my third stepfather. This is my second stepmother. Because we've allowed Satan to creep, creep in and destroy what God built, what God ordained. In verse 20, it goes on to say, Therefore says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place, and man and on beasts and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. God is saying, when, when he sees sin, because of idolatry comes sin. And when he sees sin engulf a society, a people, a nation, it, it, it becomes to a point where it's beyond, it's beyond repair. God says, my judgment is all that's left. Because it refused my grace and my mercy, judgment is all that's left. And God said, I'm bringing forth wrath and judgment. Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, it says, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to stand? There will come a day in the future when the opening of the sixth seal comes, where people will know that it's the wrath of God. They will absolutely know that it is the wrath of God, or it's the wrath of Jesus Christ. And they will say, Hide us from this day. Hide us. There is a day that is coming for those who unbelieve. Go with me to verse 25. It says, Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt, until this day I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising early and sending them. Yet you do not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffen their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. You shall speak all these words to them, Jeremiah, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer to you. And you shall say to them, this is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God or accept correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up a lamentation on the bare heights for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. In 2 Corinthians 16, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Verses 14 and 18, the New Testament says it like this. It says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Bilal? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And therefore God says, come out from their midst, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and, your, and, and my daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. God is saying, come to me. Come out of darkness and come into my light. You know what is dark. You know what's in the dark, deep corners of the earth and what's in the dark depths of society, says God. You know what's there. And God is saying, walk away. Come, come to me. Come to the light. Trust in the light. Come. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. He is the light of the world. And Jesus says, come to me. Be separate. Touch no one clean thing. Touch no one clean thing. Come to me. And I will be your father. 
I will be your father. You will be my sons and daughters. You will know how to live. You will know the plan of God. You will understand the salvation and the strong arm of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know. But in Jeremiah's time, he was telling them, but you refused it. You refused it. You're stiff-necked. What did Stephen, the first martyr of the church of Jesus Christ, what did he say before they stoned him to death in the book of Acts? He said, but you're like your fathers. You're stiff-necked. You always resist the truth. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Always. And they stoned him to death. Stephen spoke of the day in the book of Acts of the children of Israel when they were left out of Egypt. And this is the same word that Jeremiah spoke. He reminded them of how God led them out of Egypt and God provided for them and God met their every need. That they wore the same clothes for 40 years, the same shirt for 40 years, and it did not tear, it did not become dirty. For 40 years, imagine wearing the same shoes. The same socks. God met their need. They never wearied. Their food was there every day. There was water every day. There was a cloud over them during the day. And there was a fire on them at night to stay warm. God met their need in that desert for 40 years. And today, we can't meet God supernaturally like that. We can't trust God. The, the, the people of God in America, they don't want to meet God supernaturally anymore. They want to take it for themselves. They want to try and earn the living on their own. They, they want to say, I think I know what's best for me. They, they choose what college they think is right. They choose what job they think is right. They choose their spouses who they think they should marry. And they leave God out of everything. And God is saying, you're being adopted into the ways of the society of the world. And you're not trusting in my kingdom, in my and my, my, my glory and, and what I have to give to you. And that's why we see such people living in the church of God living in such horrible conditions because they do not trust in doing God's way. And God is saying, come out of them. Be separate. I'll be your father. I mean, I'll take care of you. And he's a good, righteous, holy father. He knows exactly what you need. But if we, as the church of Jesus Christ, if we're not going to stand for Jesus Christ and society, we're not going to stand for what's right and for what's holy then how can we expect to be honored by God? I beg, I, this was a plea from God in 2 Corinthians. God is pleading with us. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. Verse 30. It says, For the sons of Judah have done that which is evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have said their detestable things in the house which is called by my name to defile it. And here's where we go. He says in verse 31, They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not even come to my mind. God is saying, outside of Jerusalem, there was a valley known as Hinnom. It was a, it was a big, deep pit. And the people would take the trash and the garbage, <coughs> they would throw it into this pit, and outside of Jerusalem, and it was burning day and night. It stunk horribly. And that's where they would take the trash. And they began to, because of pagan worship was creeping into society of God's people, in order to have a house, to bless the house, they had to, some of the pagan societies had a belief where, a pagan worship, false belief, they thought if you were to kill your child and put him into the walls of the house, and into that, into that hard baked brick, that that would bring blessings in your family, in your house. And they were sacrificing their children. And then they were taking their other sons and daughters and they were throwing them into the fire. They were killing them and throwing them into that pit, which was outside of Jerusalem. Why? So that they could have a good life. So that they would be all, they would be blessed by false gods. That they would be blessed by false gods. That's no different than from today what's happening in America. Today in America, we, it's called abortion. It's called abortion today. And our Supreme Court has said that it's legal. Our Supreme Court has said that it's okay. That, that we, we can do this. That, that doctors legally can murder. That it's okay. So that, that's what we're doing right now. We're allowing these babies to be murdered. It's just a dishwasher or something over there. Don't worry about it. Focus out on that. 
where, why, why does abortion happen? A high percentage number of the time is because of this. Because the people that have unwanted pregnancies, they don't fit their lifestyle. They're not ready to have a baby. They're too busy partying still. They're too busy, they, 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 they ain't finished college, they gotta do this, they gotta do that. They're stuck on self, they're caught up in idolatry, and a child is just not something they need. And that's why we see so much abortion. It's the same thing as recorded in Jeremiah. They were killing their children because they were stuck on idolatry and worshiping self. Verse 32, it says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will be no longer called Topheth or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of the slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth, because there is no other place. The dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the sky and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. What is it saying? It says that the people that live like this, the people that dishonor God and are caught up in these sinful lifestyle, it says that God is going to give to them what they've given to others. And it was disgraceful for people to be buried in an unopened grave in those times. You had to bury them. And it was disgraceful, it was dishonorable to leave a dead body out like that for the birds to come eat it. And God is saying, but that's what's going to happen to this generation we're living in. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 21, when Jesus comes back, here's what happens to all the evil people on the face of the earth. It says, And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Matthew 24, 27, 28 says this, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. What it talks about is that people who are living in idolatry and in sin and reject the, the plan of salvation of Jesus Christ, it says that they will die in shame. They will die in disgrace. They will die in such horrible conditions. They will go to the Valley of Hinnom. Not the Valley of Hinnom, which was in Jerusalem, but the Valley of Hell, to the eternal lake of fire. We've got to get the bigger picture of what God is saying here in, in, in Jeremiah. In verse 34, as we close, it says, Then I will make to cease from the cities of Judah, from the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of joy, of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land will become a ruin. The land will become a ruin. There is such murder, greed, perversion on the face of this earth. And God will do away with this earth. We're not called to hate this world. You know what I mean? You know, God wants us to enjoy the sunset and to enjoy the mountains and the beach. Yes, but I'm talking about the ways of this world. We have to want to see these things go away. And I want to take you to the last scripture. Where in Revelation 21, 1 through 8, it says this. And see, you, you, you talk about wrath and judgment. You also got to talk about the grace and mercy of God Almighty too. You got to preach the full counsel of God. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it says this. And at the end of the Bible, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. There's no longer death, no longer any mourning or any crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. And God has made ready as this as a bride going for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall be with his people. I need to read this again because... This is uh, something that Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away And there is no longer any sea And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem Coming down out of heaven from God Made ready as a bride and born for her husband And I heard a loud voice from the throne Saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men And he will dwell among them And he shall, he shall be their people And God himself will be among them And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will longer be, no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. 
And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit all these things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Which is the second death. Second death that matters. For us, being children of God, the second death don't matter. Because we, we won't go there. To be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's the promise and the blessing that we have as Christians. But there's going to come a time where God will judge. But His grace is here today. Amen. His grace is here today. Accept His grace. Accept His mercy. The plan of God for His church is so great. Again, we can't just be together on a Sunday morning and, and then take on that world and only meet one day a week. We need to allow God to be God in our life. We need to, we, we need to be the church. We need to begin to share testimonies of the power of God amongst each other. Amen. And be real, be sincere. That's where it's going to begin. God moves through unity. He don't move through one person. He moves through unity. Amen. He moves through unity. And that's the breakthrough that we need as a ministry. That's the breakthrough you need, I need in our personal lives. God's grace and mercy is great, but His wrath and judgment shall follow for those who do not accept. 